SpaceX's Starship spacecraft won't be able to make it all the way to the moon, never mind Mars, all by itself. To get it into orbit and then continue its journey, each Mars or moon-bound Starship will have to meet up in orbit with its brethren in order to fuel up for the journey beyond Earth. But how would they fuel each other? How many extra starships will it take to get a single one to the moon and Mars? That remains unclear. This is an image of how the starship will be refueled while going into space released by SpaceX in 2019. In less than two years, a lot of design changes and improvements for both the ship and the booster has taken place. At the same time, SpaceX has changed plans for Starship's orbit refueling. So the big question here is what will SpaceX's new plan for refueling pertain? On Saturday, August 7th, Tim Dodd from Everyday Astronaut released part 2 of his Starbase tour with Musk. In this video, they discussed the Starship refueling system. Tim asked Elon about the butt to butt refueling in orbit and that Elon needs to start testing that refueling system. Elon responded, no, and he added, we're gonna get to orbit and back first. We don't need orbital refueling unless you're going to the moon or going to Mars. Then you need orbital refueling. And he also said, I'm not sure it will be the butt to butt. It might be something different. We switched the propellant full drain lines to the side. But one caveat here is they still refuel through their skirts, kind of like the old butt-to-butt, -butt, except using the new side skirt ports. Can we stop saying butt-to-butt, -butt, please? <laughs> it sounds so weird. The previous strategy was dramatically altered by this plan, which may be a fantastic but risky SpaceX idea. <laughs> the butt-to-butt -butt seems to be more simply because it could be imagined the fluids flow downwards with a slight eulage push in one direction. With the new plan, they don't have that same balance advantage. Recently, a new render by SpaceX enthusiast Irk X has shown the new Starship orbital refueling method as described by Elon Musk, and he shared this amazing 3D design showing how Starship side-to-side -side refueling works, on top of the crewed ship and on the bottom of the cargo ship. And it drew the approval of Elon Musk, who replied with two fire emojis, because that is much more fire than saying butt to butt constantly. Okay, I'd rather say side to side refueling. <laughs> However, to prove it can ensure it works as planned, SpaceX will need to spend a lot more time and money to research and explore more. So, how important is the refueling method that makes SpaceX find any ways to make it happen? In orbit, refueling is integral to the space company's mission. In October, NASA awarded SpaceX a $53 million contract to perform a propellant transfer demonstration. Combining Starship's rapid reusability with orbital refueling is critical to economically transporting large numbers of crew and cargo to the Moon and Mars, SpaceX wrote in a tweet at the time. This is also easy to understand because with a reusable rocket, it takes almost all the fuel in the booster and the ship just to put something into orbit. And that is the point. There is barely any propellant left. There's just enough for the Starship to deorbit aero break through the atmosphere using the skydiver or the belly flop maneuver and land. So, if it wants to go for longer trips, it will definitely have to refuel. So, how many launches will SpaceX need to refuel a Starship to the Moon and Mars? For the Artemis moon mission, according to the latest information from the GAO, it is revealed that SpaceX needs to launch 16 starships to complete this mission, which stating that SpaceX requires 14 refuels of the propellant depot in orbit. That means that for Starship to be able to land a spacecraft on the moon, it will need enough fuel from 14 recharges. Each launch must ensure 100% success and reach the exact location where the Starship needs to refuel. Ugh, indeed, it's a huge and risky challenge for SpaceX. As for the mission to Mars, SpaceX has not yet announced the number of times it needs refueling, 
but the trip to Mars is about 300 million miles, and that's 480 million kilometers for all you Europeans out there with your uh, metric system. <laughs> and takes about seven months to fly. Compared to the moon, it is 240,000 miles or 386,400 kilometers from Earth and takes about three days to land. So sure, the company will need a lot of refueling times when it gets to Mars. Well, I don't want to imagine any more of that. The test, which has yet to be scheduled, will involve 10 metric tons of liquid oxygen being transferred from Starship to another. But first, SpaceX will have to demonstrate that its Starship and Super Heavy are able to get into orbit in the first place. And only then will the company be able to start seriously considering an orbital refueling maneuver. The next thing I want to talk to you about is how SpaceX will acquire the satellite connectivity startup Swarm Technologies. SpaceX is making big money moves with small satellites. On Monday, CNBC announced that the spaceflight firm is acquiring Swarm Technologies. The California-based firm claims to have the smallest commercially operational satellites in space, with each similar in size to a small book. The acquisition is its latest move in its growing satellite operations. It's unclear at this stage what SpaceX plans to do with Swarm, but it comes as the firm works to build out its Starlink constellation of satellites in low Earth orbit. So SpaceX bought Swarm, but first off, what is Swarm? Swarm was founded in 2016. In its last fundraising round in January of 2019, it was valued at $85 million. It offers low-cost internet connectivity for the Internet of Things devices, where SpaceX's Starlink is focused on internet access for computers and smartphones, Swarm is more interested in industry sensors like buoys at sea, smart energy meters, and agriculture sensors. These are the sort of devices that need a reliable connection at a low price, but maybe don't need such high speeds or low latencies as those offered by Starlink. Swarm has developed a tiny Space B satellite, which measures just 11 centimeters by 11 by 2.8, which is around 4.33 inches by another 4.33 by 1.1 inches. That makes it a quarter the size of a standard CubeSat satellite, favored by students and researchers for small projects in space. These satellites weigh just 400 grams, or 0.88 pounds, if anyone ever really measures pounds like that. The firm is developing a constellation of 150 Space B satellites. Swarm. What does it mean for Starlink? How are these two going to cooperate? It's unclear at this stage what SpaceX's acquisition means for Starlink. In the firm's FCC documents, SpaceX wrote that it will benefit from access to the intellectual property and expertise developed by the Swarm team, as well as from adding this resourceful and effective team to SpaceX. Swarm, the filing claims, will benefit from the better capitalization and access to resources available to SpaceX as well as the synergies associated with acquisition by a provider of satellite design, manufacture, and launch services. Another benefit is that it could enable SpaceX to acquire several FCC licenses in a short space of time. These licenses can take a while to acquire. As SpaceX gears up to roll out Starlink further this year, the reasoning behind the swarm acquisition could become clearer soon. And that concludes today's episode. As always, thumbs up if you liked today's episode, subscribe if you haven't, and hit the bell so you won't miss out on new great SpaceX content. Once again, thank you so much. As a reminder, if you have any ideas on what we should talk about in the upcoming episode, leave a comment down below along with your opinions on what you were thinking about during today's topics. Okay. Other than that, from all of us here at Great SpaceX, see you next time.